So, um, oh, let me go back to the beginning. Here we go. So I am, hi, hi, <laughs> a couple of people that are here, <laughs> one person. Um, I'm Jenny Blake and um, I'm a painter. Um, and I'm gonna start with a series of paintings of mine of the bathing ponds in, uh, in Hampstead in London, actually. So, um, um, the first one that uh, I'll show you is is um, is an oil painting on a on a on board, and it, it's a bit of a was a bit of a breakthrough painting for me because um, I'm, I studied uh, fine art painting, uh, which was quite kind of an analytical, um, observational training. And, uh, and then I went on to, to do a two year drawing course at the, at the uh, Royal Drawing School. Um, and this painting was a bit after that where uh, at the drawing school at the time we were, you know, students were encouraged strongly to, to make paintings from drawings. So this painting's the first time I'd managed to to do that, so I was sketching at the at the bathing ponds on Hampstead Heath, bringing back my drawings to the studio, and then translating those marks uh, into paint. Um, whereas before I was paint, you know, painting from direct observation. So a kind of yeah, using the imagination more in a way. Um, and then, and then, sort of at the same time, I think at around the same time, I was, I was, I actually know to make in order to make this painting work, I had a couple of them on the go because I needed to sort of experiment with mark making. So the ones that that didn't work out, I I ended up sort of chopping up and sanding down, and they became much smaller panels that I end, ended up taking to the ponds, to the ladies' ponds actually, and, the, and painting uh, quick, in situ um, sketches of, of the bathers there. So this one's called um, Back and Basket. And I think, and you can see that, you know, the under painting is a rubbed back sort of, yeah, board that, that, that from a previous artwork. You can see that even more clearly on, in this one. This one's called Three Friends. They're quite small. They're um, you know, 30 by 20 centimeter panels. Um, sometimes they're, you know, they're, sometimes they're more imagined. Sometimes they're unfinished. Sometimes they're um, no, an amalgamation of, of body parts if people have moved. But I've spent, you know, probably from between, uh, I've done a while back now, between 2000 and made some point between 2006 and 2012. Um, and, I've, and I've got quite a big body of work. I've got quite a lot of these. I've, I've exhibited them. These, these three now, uh, these three are sold. So I don't have them anymore, but um, yeah. This one here is called Shade. Um, and because I was returning to the same ponds, the same meadow, you really get to know the people that come regularly. So it's actually a community. And, um, you know, I don't become part of that community, although, you know, the women there do say hello to me. But I think, you know, as a painter, it's quite voyeuristic. You, you still, you're very much an outsider and you need to be. But I do like listening to the conversations of the friends of the people that know each other and swim there regularly. Everybody's got a story um, and a reason for being there. It's quite a restorative place. Um, the next one, is let's see if I ah there we go yeah so slightly different format same size um, portrait format so the one on the left is called folded limbs and the one on the right sideways view and um, the, the 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 second one the sideways view is a slightly different part of the ponds where you can 
<clears throat> look smaller meadow where the women often change and you can look across to the one of the boating ponds um slightly different feel to it um let's see my next so that's one body of work i also paint in dartmoor on dartmoor um, so for the last 20 years i've been running landscape painting trips um, to Dartmoor that started when I was a student and I'd go there as part of the, our university painting trips. And then I sort of fell in love with the landscape, uh, kept going back and then started running my own courses there. Um, so I could go back to the same place every year. It's on North Dartmoor and there's a, um, I don't know if anybody's been to it, very wild, very open, very barren expanse and uh, quite harsh uh, place to landscape paint. So I don't often go up onto the moor to paint because uh, you can just, you know, it's kind of all weathers really. Um, you can get really caught out from sort of, um, yeah, rain comes chucking down, there's no shelter. So quite just near to the, the moor, there's also woods. So I often go there to paint and there's a river that runs through the woods called the River Teen. Um, and I've been drawn back to that spot again and again and again, not just because I run the trips, but the, that there's a particular place in the woods that I paint. So I will show you some river paintings next. Um, so this is looking downstream and I guess the challenge there was to try and get the water to flow away from me um, which was oh no I, I haven't captured but there's some you know some movement there I suppose and I've painted this river in every colour under the sun so it was a real revelation to me a few years back when I realized that the river is actually just black you know it's quite dark it's peaty water very um kind of inky and yeah i i couldn't believe it's ta it taken me years and years and years to to kind of i kind of ignoring the fact that it was black so then i i did a series of black <laughs> when i had that light bulb moment black river paintings um and that started a kind of fascination with the, with the color black uh, and painting with, with, with blacks. Um, and there, you know, you can see a figure appearing and then the figure disappeared, I couldn't get it to work. But I guess that um, the main objective is me, for me when I'm painting the, the water is, uh, well, I always want to bring a sense of playfulness, which I, in this painting, I don't, necessarily think I have but I suppose because I painted so many of them and then the one before is is a is a, trying to remember sort of 60 or 50 by 70 um 70 something centimeters so it's quite long thin format um and that's previously how I always worked I would draw uh the space work out the the edges of the picture, then bring a canvas or find a canvas that would, would suit uh, that format. But then when I started making these black paintings, I just brought loads of canvases that are all the same size. And again, another series started to emerge, a body of work started to emerge. And that kind of really allowed me to experiment um, and make the same painting in different ways. So I started to kind of loosen up, experiment with mark making, in different ways, um, drip, pour, you know, dunk the canvas, whatever it takes, but all at the same time still observing, obviously, as well. So the paintings change, the, the, the quality of the paint changes, the, the, how I apply the paint, how thick, thin it is, has changed, changes with each, with each picture as so I'm experimenting on how to try and paint this impossible subject. Um, then I, then I, I'm always interested in trying to bring the figure in because one, as you can probably tell that 
uh, I'm quite into water and swimming is a subject that interests me. Um, so this, and then again, I suppose with this one, the idea of the, the mark making and the playfulness coming into it um, and trying to be less descriptive about what I'm seeing uh, and allow the imagination to come in. With the, the next one, it's a slightly bigger painting um, and at the, the top where the foliage um, comes in to the picture, it's, it's drawn on with pastel, chalk pastels. And I, it was just a kind of black space with a bit of light coming through. And then this group of kids came, came down and much bigger group than I've captured. About 40 children came down on a summer camp and just started to jump. There's a bit of the river where I paint, where it flattens out and there's a weir and you can swim there and you can stand there and you can, I can build a shelter. I can leave my easel and my painting under a rock um, for the night and return again the next day. And um, So it sort of becomes like an outdoor studio, I suppose. Anyway, I go with a group of, of people um, and last year, I think it was, I made this painting, which is of one of my friends, I suppose, uh, somebody who's come on the trip, uh, swimming. Um, and this is a kind of the beginning of something new for me, I suppose, a different way of working um, where, where it's a bit more open. It's not so much a landscape painting anymore. It becomes something else. And that led me to painting a, another version of what you've just seen. So the painting before is called Katie. And this is Katie again. This one's called Miss Her. And it's very much about, you know, I pre-painted the, the canvas, this golden yellow colour. I, I couldn't bring this, this picture down to the river. It's far too big. It's 50 by no, it might be even bigger, 70 by 90 centimetres. Um, so this was painting, painted kind of at the camp where we, where we stay. And, um, but it's so it's from memory, it's from other paintings, it's from drawings, it's from photographs. And Matt, again, a kind of, a bit of everything really. Um, the next painting, continuation of the, the river swimming theme, um, but here I am, I made a box <laughs> and I, I'm again just trying to have fun with my art. So I made a box that I painted a, a, a Miro, like the artist, the, the artist above, I don't know if you can see. I'm a big fan of Miro and I painted a, a homage to Miro on the box and I asked a friend to, or maybe even I swam with this box head early in the morning one day, just messing about. Anyway, we took some photographs and it sort of thought, oh, that, you know, maybe I can do something with that. Maybe I can make a painting from it. And it didn't really work as, a, as, a, as an image um, because the Miro wasn't a clear enough motif. So I changed it to this checkered pattern and thought, no, now, I, now I've got an idea for a painting. So this, so then my friend very kindly got in the river and posed for me. <laughs> and this painting is painted uh, from, from that. Um, and that's the last one of the, of the River Teen series for now. Well, it's this, the last three are not part of the same series, so development on from it. Um, next, I thought it'd be worth showing you um, a strand of my practice, which is drawing, prints and mixed media. So drawing is always the backbone of, of my practice. Um, um, as I said before, I studied at drawing for a couple of years. Um, this is the drawing of the ladies pond, which relates to the earlier series that I showed you. Um, and I, ha over the years have experimented in various forms of mixed media. So the next image is 
similar drawing um, where I'm experimenting with language, the language of mark making, but this time it's mono printed onto some fabric, organza fabric. And then I experimented with fabric and printing for a little while. Uh, I'm not doing that so much anymore, but I made a, through the, from those experiments, I made a, some, some work, very small bits of work where I, I kind of stretched this transparent fabric that's been mono, that's been printed on. I stretched it over, a, you know, a, some stretcher bars slightly raised and I played with overlapping that the transparent image over the top of another image. So it becomes a kind of hologrammy type box piece of art and I'm embroidered into it as well. Um, you know, they're, they're only very small. And this is another one of, of that ilk um, where the figure is printed onto some spotty fabric and then there's dot spots behind, um, you know, a couple of centimeters between each layer. So it looks different depending on the angle that you're viewing it from. So still life, as I said before, my training is very kind of from a this sort of rigorous analytical observational drawing the figure and drawing the still life for months on end. Um, but mo more recently, I do paint in the studio. I do paint still life in the studio, but I've had to um, think about the objects <laughs> that I paint. And because I also teach, um, I need things that don't disappear or rot or <laughs> disintegrate. Um, so I did these very small series of domestic objects um, on oil on board. This one, there's a few of them. Nail brush, uh, <laughs> scourer. Um, <clears throat> thinking about kind of home life and femininity and uh, thinking about Philip Guston, funnily enough, in that one with the colors. Um, but also kind of linking it in a strange way to my interest in water. Um, during the pandemic, <laughs> I was forced out of the studio into the, into the home where I started recording um, my family, drawing my family um, as we were all kind of stuck and in it all together. So that has led me to making work that's a bit, that's more personal, I suppose I would say. I enjoyed the fact that art came into the home. Um, I've always wanted the two to cross over somehow and it never really happened before until now. Um, so this is a drawing, pastel drawing. The next painting is a fairly large um, so round painting. Um, that is still on the go actually, still, still painting that. So this is my most recent work, this painting, it's painted in the studio. Um, this is a kind of departure from the landscape stuff that I've sh shown you earlier. And this is very much about family, family life, you know, I start, I, I, I write a lot and I draw a lot in my, in, and this, this is a painting that kind of came to me as a sketch, I suppose, a little thumbnail sketch um, that, that developed into something more substantial uh, where I've printed over it as well. Um, and that kind of brings me to the end of the show. And the last image that I'm gonna show you and talk to you very briefly about is um, just my experiments into surrealism because I, as I said earlier I, I also teach I've been teaching about surrealism for about 10 years now and um, recently I decided to um, 
to organize and curate an exhibition about uh, celebrating the centenary or the run up to centenary, because we're not there yet, um, of surrealism of, um, and celebrate the, the female artists of, of the surrealist movement by curating a show of women artists, not necessarily women uh, surrealist artists, but um, perhaps people who have elements of surrealism in their work. So I, this, is a, this is one of a collage that I made. Um, and I'm just in the process at the moment of, of inviting artists and, and thinking about that exhibition and getting excited about that exhibition. Uh, which will be later on in the year. So yeah, that's me. <laughs> if you have any questions, I'd be happy to try and answer them. I hope I've, uh, I hope that's okay, Alice. Brilliant, thank you so much. <laughs> I love the domestic work that you make. Um, the, you can definitely tell the water reference having, you know, heard um, your presentation, but um, the domestic objects, that, that, I think that's because it's my personal kind of obsession in my art practice. Okay. That's why I'm drawn to, drawn to them, but I think both the collage work and the, the your painted um, work as well, um, that, you, that work with the domestic objects are, are fantastic. Um, it's great to see the breadth of work as well. I really enjoyed that, thank you. Thank you, thanks very much. Thanks yeah. for your time. Um, I would be interested in um, getting any feedback, not uh, on like kind of honest, how do you say it? Yeah, honest critique, honest feedback, because this is the first time I've ever done anything oh. like this, presented my work like this. <laughs> yeah. I so love, I love the I think, water paintings, they're very good. They're very, very excellent. Just the more textural approach and the contrast between the black and the, the edges. Very good. Yeah, I see those. Uh, the, the box head is genius. Absolute genius. Sorry? The, the box head. Oh, the box head. Sorry, my microphone okay. slipped there. Yeah, okay. the box head. It's just um, being able to inject an element of humor into art is very, very important, I think. And it's just, that is just perfection, I think. <laughs> But also, it's interesting the way that the the faces blur in those ones compared to the others. That's my dogs now barking. Stop that, Molly! Stop. Yeah. So yeah, that's that. I find that intriguing that the faces are actually blurring because it's actually parallel in glitch art. You see a lot of distortions to faces and um, mixing up of elements like that. The blur, the fact, yeah, the yeah. fact is, yeah, yeah, getting rid of the the face, yeah. 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 Or the face yeah. taking on different forms that you wouldn't yeah. expect. Yes. That's intriguing in itself, I think. Yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah. A mask, I suppose. Yeah. Could James be. Ensor, that's what came to mind. If right. You know. Yeah, his okay. mask paintings. Okay. James, sorry, who? James Ensor. I think it's James Ensor. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah I think I know who you mean. Yeah. yeah. Some, somebody's got their hand up. Yes. <laughs> Andrew, do I need to unmute you or can you unmute yourself? I think you can, yeah. I think I can unmute myself. Yeah, you have. Have yeah. I? <laughs> um, that was great, thanks. I really enjoyed that. Um, if I'd seen, um, actually, I had three questions, but I'll just ask one. If I'd seen a box head swimming painting, I I wouldn't have thought that it had really happened. Yeah, yeah. I I would have thought that it was your. It was some sort of, I'll misuse this term because I'm not, I don't have much, I'm not an artist, so my art history knowledge is very sketchy. But in my head, if I'd looked at that, I'd have gone, mm, some sort of surrealist thing going on. But the fact that you actually had done it, <laughs> or at least want to tell a story that you did it, that someone actually swam, if I got that right, someone actually swam right. in the river with that right. thing, that box head. Yeah. That's fantastic. And I was wondering why I like that so much. Okay. Why I, why I like the fact that you actually did it. As opposed to it just being a surreal, yeah. Yeah. Maybe because you, it, yeah, I, I mean, I don't have the answer to that. I guess you can, 
imagine how bonkers <laughs> a moment it was, <laughs> which it really was. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't, my friend didn't, didn't, I mean, she's kind of game and up for most things. So she's a good one to call on for this sort of thing. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. That's interesting feedback though, to think, you know, to, re to, to, to be told that actually as the viewer, you wouldn't necessarily think that that would moment would have happened. It can just be, of course, it can just be invented. For me, it's, <laughs> it's obvious. It's, <laughs> it honestly has happened. Um, so yeah. And then I guess, so I guess, yeah, that was really, it really was born out of a celebration. It's a homage in a way, a celebration, a homage to, to as I was saying to Miro and also came out of the fact that the previous work I was doing was about swimming, a celebration of swimming as well, swimming with an, a, a kind of crown of flowers, an adorned uh, moment of swimming. So perhaps that's why it's fun in that sense, because it is quite a celebratory bit of work. Yeah. Any other questions? Thank you for your feedback. It's really good to get the um, get people's interpretations of how the work reads because it's there's the person making it. It's, it's hard to know. I think there's a um, playfulness in your work that uh, is really needed at the moment, actually. Great. I really, I really like the painting of the women in their ponds by the ponds, and your your drawing I thought was really. Um, detailed and imaginative. So um, I'm actually writing a book called about surrealist sewing projects. So I'd really like to talk to you about your work. Great, at yeah. Another time, and yeah. uh, I'm also writing about drawing. So oh. I'd like to, I'd like to see the work because it's quite. I'm, I'm looking at this on my phone. And yeah. I can't see the detail. Okay. But, yeah. Um, your work still had uh, an impact, even though I'm looking on a tiny screen. So it must be interesting work. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, please do get in touch, Jenny Blake, art okay. on Instagram, or find okay. uh, through my website, which is Jenny Blake Wright. Um, yeah, it's interesting because you were talking earlier, um, crash stop about language, which really something I think about all the time because drawing is a language yeah. mm. art making you know I always say to people because I teach that you can you can you can learn to draw it's not something that we're mm. all born gifted at and it's just yeah. like learning any language it's just yeah. one mark at a time yeah that's a basic technical skill which teach you, teaches yeah. you how to observe and look and see and that's it's as one of my old tutors said it, it's thinking with drawing observing with drawing i suppose yeah yes yeah and just keeping mm. adding those marks to your yeah you know, and without um I mean, what, what did he say to me yeah you basically forget about what's in front of you and just explore what it is you forget the name for it and start actually drawing what's in front of you yeah mm. that was yeah uh, did the right drawing on the right side of the brain the work by Betty Edwards, who she she asked people to draw without looking at the paper, even. Right. Yeah, yeah, it's exercises I did at college as well, yeah. back in the eighties. That's one of the standard methods they used then in the college I went to. Yeah, yeah. that's fun. <laughs> okay, thanks. I'm going to hand it over. <laughs> oh. Yes. So, just to introduce myself. Um, my name is Crash Dot, which is actually not my real name, uh, it's my working name. Um, there's reasons behind that, which I won't go into now. Um, I'm based in rural Ireland, though originally I'm from the UK. So now I've got to remember how to do this. Share screen. Aha, there we go. Share, right. So this is going to be a quick presentation first. Um, I'll just do what Jenny did, because that actually seems like the most obvious thing to do. So my name is Crashtop. 
my working name. Um, before we go any further, I do have to give this an epilepsy warning because this, this is actually standard amongst people who work with glitch art um, because we use flashing images, um, flickers, generated patterns, which some people may find disturbing. So if there is anybody present with photosensitive epilepsy, I'd like to know now because it's, it's kind of important. If there isn't, I'll just carry on. It's just the basic warning I have to give. Okay, so what do I do? I make glitch art, which can be seen as an interrogation and subversion of the software and hardware that has come to dominate our lives in the form of devices, the internet, and our daily experience of a computer mediated environment, be it in offices, transport services, or entertainment. I will say as well, um, it's going to be a quick presentation, then I'm going to go on to the main bit. And if anybody has any questions about anything I'm saying, just jump in, because some of the stuff you might not be familiar with. So glitch art can be defined by its reliance on process over finish. How we do things is almost as important as the result. It can be as technical or as crude as you like, but it does imply a working knowledge of computers devices and software, which I've come to see as a new form of artistic literacy. Um, I'm influenced by the work of Stan Brakage. Um, and he set out some of his ideas in a booklet called Metaphors of Vision, which you can actually still find on archive.org and download for free. And especially his idea of the untutored eye. And that led me to formulate a set of guidelines for myself when I make work. So I make mainly video work for the majority of time. And I have these set of rules that I use. So basically naturalism in film is a construct and a betrayal of possibility. Narrative is unimportant. The moving image can be treated as a material like paint. In editing, seek what is interesting visually rather than a story. And the viewer is allowed to move backwards or forwards through the finished piece, creating it for themselves. Now, nothing really is ever finished in glitch art. So when I say finished, I mean the piece as I presented it. I could go back and rework it. And so the last point is particularly important when considering the way that we engage with work online. Now, my, pretty much all of my work is online. And a viewer can scroll through a YouTube or a peer tube video to points that they like or are attracted to. What catches the eye might not be the old norms of narrative structure and linear time due to the way that our perception has been retrained over time with our engagement with the internet. So as advertising and popular culture influence post-war art movements such as pop art, glitch art reflects and is influenced by online culture and the everyday experience of software and hardware failure. So one of my biggest influences at the moment is a work by one of the early net art pioneers. Uh, they're called Jody. They're actually two people. And it's a work called My Desktop. And that's from 2002. You can find this on YouTube. And it's basically a performance piece they actually call a performance piece where they do all these mad things on their desktop and they call up multiple files and folders. So in the end, it, you can't work out whether the computer is malfunctioning or whether they're doing what they're doing deliberately. So everything becomes blurred. Um, so that comes out of actually my research for and um, work with a group called Format C. Um, it's an arts organization based in Zagreb. I'm actually an associate member of them, which is Zagreb in Croatia. And they are a non-profit organization based in Zagreb in the EU, active in the area of visual and multimedia art. Their focus or our focus is a new media art experiment, and non-profit collaborative creation, cultural creation. And they're supported by the Ministry of Culture in Croatia. Now, this seems odd that I'm a UK born island based artist and I'm actually part, it's actually the first arts organization I've ever been part of, and it's actually based in Croatia. But when you start to work online, that's kind of what happens rather than focusing on groups around you 
in the immediate kind of vicinity physically. Um, I join groups like Glitch Artists Collective on Facebook and a lot of the groups that I work with or people that I work with, I'd meet through that group, even though I'm not on Facebook anymore, I still keep in contact with them. And also through open calls for online festivals like the Ron Biennale, which I've exhibited with. And it kind of sidesteps nationalities and borders in a way that the traditional art scene doesn't seem to do. The noises in the background are my two dogs. They're just sitting on the bed next to me. Just Anyway, so the cost of entrance is very, very low in that all I need is a computer and a broadband connection to join in. So Suda is the main project that Format C is working on at the moment. I'm going to run through this fairly quickly because I want to get onto the kind of performance bit. Because to actually understand what I'm doing or we're doing, I have to demonstrate it. So what is Suda? Suda is basically an online and offline collaborative desktop environment built on the outlines, ideas outlined in the in initial manifesto document, which you can find online, and on the ideas of Libra culture and Libra software. Um, so some of the themes that run through my work um, are primarily around ideas of remix culture and the Creative Commons licensing structures. Now, if you don't know what those are, a guy called Lawrence Lessig came up with kind of a lot of ideas about remix culture, which is basically taking stuff which has been made before and making it into something new and more interesting. So it transcends the original source material. And Creative Commons is a way of licensing your work to be seen and reused online. So I don't actually sell any of my work. I put it online and I grant people a license to reuse that in any way they wish, but under certain, certain circumstances. It's quite important to the way that I work. So as it says here, my work is basically about Creative Commons, Libra software. Libra software means that you can run any program that you want to on your computer. I can share that software with you openly. And there are no licenses with that other than the open source licenses that come with them. So there's no copyright issues or issues like that you think of when you're pirating software. There's no pirating software involved in Libra software because it's all free. And I'm also into making software and hardware work in ways other than they're intended. So the license that I share my work under is called CC by NCSO 40, sorry, 4.0. So basically you're allowed to copy and distribute the material in any medium or format. You can remix, transform and build upon the material. But the important proviso to that is you have to give credit. You have to provide a link to the license if you reuse the work and indicate if changes were made. And you also can't use any material I share under this license for commercial purposes. But also, if you remix my work, you have to grant others the same freedoms. So it's all about freedom. There's, um, let's see, how can I explain this better? Uh, yeah, that's probably about the best way to do it. You can look at um, Creative Commons licensing up. So it's very different to, say, the traditional art world where you'd make an individual piece and that would be the piece. And because you've made it, you hold the copyright. I'm basically remaking work or making unique work and saying, here, remix it if you want to, share it if you want to, I grant you that right. So as I said, most of my work at the moment is based around the ideas of the desktop as a performative space. So because of the pandemic, obviously we've all been stuck in front of our computers. We've all been stuck in front of these keyboards. And it occurred to me, along with the work that I was doing on Suda, that our desktops can be a performance space. So I'm just gonna stop the screen share for a second and bring up the desktop. Okay, now, share that. This is gonna get a bit strange for a second. So <coughs> computer. Right, now hopefully you can see that. This is basically just a virtual machine on my machine. It's just the simplest way I could think of doing this. So while we wait for that to be, if anybody has any questions, ask now on what I've just talked about. 
So, okay, cool. Now I just have to log into this. The screen's about to get very big again. Okay. No, oh, here we are. It's not a very interesting desktop, is it? It's just very gray and uniform. So. Um, I can't see any, I can only see a black screen. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Oh, good. Uh, can anybody, everybody else could, should be able to see just the window with, if not, I can just start resharing it. Alice, can you, you it just see? It looks like a black screen to me, just completely black. Can you see that? Yeah. The hand at the top. I can see your cursor turn into a hand. Can you see a tab bar? No. Right, no. Okay. I'll stop the share and reshare it. Right. Okay. No. Yeah, there's, yeah. there's a um, black a window on a blue background. Yeah. 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 Grand. Now, so this is based on what's called the CTWM desktop. And this is basically the format that Suda runs on. And it's not like Windows 95 or Mac OS. It comes from about 1992. But the thing about it is that it's very configurable. I'm just going to show you the configuration file. So, Okay, so this is basically how it's configured. You write, there's certain sections and you write in what programs you want to run. Now, the advantage with this is that I can then run what's known as shell scripts. I'm just gonna throw my piece of paper away now and just go for it. Okay, so this is a configuration file. Um, and that tells the desktop how to look, what the menus look like, what programs are present. Now, this might seem very boring to begin with, but it's actually a feedback environment. So if you think of your desktop as a feedback environment, we can do clever things like this. Now you should see a square and you should see lines appearing in there now. I'm always mindful of the delay and lag on, in, on the internet. And you can see the mouse chasing around after itself. Now, basically what I've done is, this is a process whereby the computer creates a window via a program called FMPEG, but the focus is always on the mouse point. So if you think of the mouse point of the lens as a lens of a camera, and as you move about, I'm gonna pull up the second window now. So one window isn't very interesting, but if you add two windows, you can start doing this. Now you see you start getting trails and traces like that. But what you can also do is bring up movies. And this is actually how I work a lot of the time now. So we'll bring up this. This is a pre-prepared movie. Just have to resize that. Uh, make that smaller now. So you can see now, because the mouse pointer is over the movie, the movie is actually being displayed in the windows like that. Now, so far, so simple, but you can bring up as many of these windows as you want to do. So let's just bring up a dis slightly different window. Uh, which one should we bring up? That one. Takes a few seconds for this to load because it's running in a virtual machine. Aha, there we go. So this is a bigger window. Now, because of the way that FMPEG works, you can run things which are known as displacement maps. So now, this is why I have to make the warnings about photosensitive epilepsy. You can start to see that you can create feedback like this and textures and patterns. And if we bring in another window, uh, which one should we bring in? TMV, that's gonna take a few seconds to actually load. Ah, oh, there we go. Now, so now we can create a chaotic background like that. 
And what I tend to do when I start these sessions is I'll set the, I have a screen recorder and I'll just set the screen recorder running and start recording this to try and find interesting moments in what I'm doing. So as you can see, depending on where you place the windows and the mouse cursor, will achieve different results. And these are all scripts that I've written, which run from the menus. And we can further complicate it. If we pull up the, which one shall I use now? Oh yeah, let's bring in a movie now. Let's bring in that. And hopefully, yeah, I'm gonna have to stop the sound on that one. That's better. Okay, the sound's just a distraction at this point. So now we can turn this ancient battleship Potemkin, which is a beautiful movie in its own right, we can start using that as part of our feedback. Now you may wonder, kind of, as I was saying about remix culture, a lot of what I do is finding movies which will work with this process. Black and white works really well. So you can start bringing in text elements like that and complicate it even more. But then what we could also do, once we have that, it's all about trying to find a sequence that works, that looks good, that I like enough to carry on working with. This is another script, it's called Dada Dodo, which basically takes two texts and smashes them into each other in real time. So this is, the, it actually makes it quite difficult to work as well, because it does certain things. So now we're starting to build even more complexity. And at some point I think, hmm, that's interesting. And I'll turn on the screen recorder and start capturing that. And also, you could also go online and start, uh, now I have to stop this in a very, very specific way. Uh, I'm gonna minimize that for now. <laughs> so one of the ideas behind this desktop as well is that, that it's actually quite unpredictable and hard to use. So it'll start misbehaving because of certain scripts in the background, which, ah, here we go, yeah. So if we go to... Can, can I just ask a question? Yep. Go ahead. Do you create algorithms and then something happens out of your control or do you create scripts that are quite carefully choreographed? Both. Well, I mean, okay. this is the misconception people have about coding. What I'm doing isn't coding in the strictest sense. The way the operating system that I use works, I use Linux, I don't use Windows or Mac OS. And at its heart, it's a series of very small programs that you can operate from the command line. So if I pull up, if I can pull up, <laughs> it's fighting against me now. <laughs> See, it's gone chaotic. So this is a terminal here. And I can actually run most of these scripts from the, the terminal. And you can see the program's actually writing in there now, so it's gone completely out of control, which is great. And I can actually write in all the commands that I want to from this terminal, but I've chosen to write them into scripts, which is basically repeating what I'm doing on the terminal, but in script form, so I can call them a lot easier. So I'm not really using algorithms. I mean, I think a lot of people's conception about algorithms and the way that computers work and coding is very not wrong, but it, it's kind of, I think the media has, has dressed it up in a very strange way as being this mysterious thing. And it's not, I'm just gonna try and stop all of these things um, in a second. Can I just, ah, yeah, I can do that. Now you can see everything. I just need to stop something. Ah, okay, yeah, cool. Ah, now it's gone complete. I'm going to have to reset this machine there because it's, oh no, there we go. It's, so it's beautiful. Going... <laughs> <laughs> I, want, I want to wear them. I want to embroider them. I, can't, I want to live in them. Well, that's, it's, it's interesting because um, were you talking about surrealist sewing beforehand? Yeah. If I remember. Yeah. Well, a lot of computing technology and a lot of glitch art actually comes from 
the original kind of weaving machines, the Jacquard loom. Yes. Yeah. So it's not so dissimilar. I'm just going to have to restart this desktop now because it's just going completely chaotic. No, I'll just log back into that. Hopefully you can still see it. So I'm back with a fresh desktop. So um, where are we in the whole thing? Uh, right. Yeah. So I'm just going to call up another script called No Random. Um, just hide that there. Um, so yes, if we're talking about coding, scripting, all the rest of it, I'll pull up a script and I'll show you. Uh, okay, so not that one. This one. This is the basic one that runs what is at the heart of sudo. And it's just telling the computer to run a certain program, which is called ffplay. And that the focus of FF, FF play will be something. Now you see the backgrounds changed there because what's happening is in the background, I have a program running, which is screenshotting the desktop as we go along and it's recording those as pictures as well. Um, so anyway, so it will follow the mouse around and it's a certain size and all the rest of it. That's not coding. It's not, a, it's not an algorithm. No. It's just a way of telling the computer to take certain actions with certain right. programs. But from very, very simple human elements, I don't use AI and I don't use kind of stuff like that deliberately. It's all put together by me. Um, from very, very simple elements, you can get very, very complex results. So mm -hmm. in the background, you can see now that's just taken a photograph of that. Uh, if we bring up the original script, which is Studacam, which is that in a few, few is it about every 30 seconds, it will take a snapshot of this. So we'll just start bringing more complexity again. Okay, that's brought that back up. Now we're going to bring in, say, that one again, because that's, so it's changed again, you can see in the background. So now this is actually this particular window here is the one that I actually discovered today. So a codec called TMV, and that's kind of intriguing. So I play around with a lot of codecs. So like the, I suppose the, the different paints, if you want, or the different uh, pencils of glitch art codecs are where it's at. So in a few seconds, that should actually change in the background again. And this is all being done in real time. So this, you could consider, now it's changed in the background again. So you can consider this to be either performance or exploration. It's like pointing a lens at a big sweetie box full of imagery, basically, that's generating on the desktop. I kind of like that. As a so when you capture this so that it's in an archive, or do you always want it to be live and ephemeral? Uh, both. Um, I've done live performances with something very similar to this. and. They're recorded straight to YouTube uh, through YouTube Live, the streaming thing. Um, let's see, black and white film, why not? Uh, I love black and white films. They're such a wonderful source of... So yeah, sometimes just for the hell of it, I'll just do it for my own enjoyment or just do it live and won't record it. And then other times I will record it and take snapshots mm -hmm. as I go along. So sometimes the snapshots are more interesting than what's being produced. And then other times I look back at the snapshots and think, that's not actually what I saw. <laughs> that's not the good things. What are the good things? <laughs> so sometimes it has an element of chance to it. Like. This is all live. It's like a performance. Yeah. yeah. I'm yeah. just telling my husband who does a lot of coding and computing. Oh, ah, right. Yeah. Uh, here he is. Tell him it's all done on Linux. So, it's all right, on Linux. Yeah. So, so yeah. a bit like he'll know what I mean. Yes, yeah. no, I know what I know what you mean because I use Windows and <laughs> I'm criticised for doing so by my husband. Yeah. Now uh, I'm bringing in a displacement map. So a displacement map is basically taking two videos or two live streams as it is now and mashing them together. Uh -huh. So you get these weird, strange effects like that, and then we can pull that in again like that. And if we want to go really mad, we can start bringing in hex editing, which is your husband will probably know. But it's a way of changing the image in real time 
but in a very specific way. Uh, is it this one? So I've got so many scripts running now. Ah, here we go. So you can do that. Yeah. All right. So, so what, what, are you, what are you using to do that? What, um, which software? FMPEG. Okay. Um, so basically using the X11 grab facility of FMPEG to turn the mouse into a lens, basically. So it follows the mouse. So the window reflects what the mouse is seeing. All right. Using black and white film. Though. Yeah. 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 I don't know. I, don't, uh, I know the stuff. I know FMPEG is, but uh, yeah. Well, I, I, I know. I know one of the developers who actually put in this particular functionality, and he's quite surprised I started using it this way. So his name's cool. Ramiro Pulla. Yeah. And great. is it ever translated into anything else like music? It looks as if it could almost become. Yeah, you can. I mean, there's an there's, audio file. Yeah, there's a whole branch of um, glitch art which basically takes video or images and turns them into sound. And you can wow. do the reverse. You can actually treat sound as an image and add image effects onto the sound mm -hmm. and then turn them back into sound afterwards. And it's kind of interesting. It's very fluid what you can do yeah. with it. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, great. So you are sharing your desktop there? Yeah, this yeah. is talk to mm. people in Art Lab. There's okay. about five of us watching. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so I'll leave you to it. I thought my husband would be interested. Yeah. yeah. I was going to ask about sound as well. Like if you worked with sound, yeah. um, or overlaid sound on any um Yeah. Yeah. I do. Like that, yeah. Yeah, I do work with sound. Um I do. Have you heard of a, a band called Oval? They're from the very beginnings of glitch in music in the early 90s. And what they did was take CDs and scratch them and what you call use markers, felt tip markers to make them deliberately jump. Uh -huh. And then they record the jumps and make those into music. And they have this wonderful statement that basically says, now we're all basically file managers which is interesting because the desktop itself, it takes, if you work this way, it takes you away from physical material stuff. So you are constantly juggling, juggling files and hard drives and you become more of a, an administrator than an artist, which is interesting as well because you're constantly changing files and stuff like that. Let's bring in another film. So this might crash at some point because it's not actually on the main computer, it's a virtual computer. So now this is a, a film which I have actually run displacement maps on. And so we'll feed that into that one again and bring this window back up like that and see what it does with that. And maybe also, let's see, what else should we bring in? Um, not that one. Uh for me, that the phrase comes to mind of this is like Dionysian, not Apollonian, which is what I never would thought, never thought I'd say that about something to do with computing. Mm. And okay. it's, I mean, people have been making art on computers for a good while. And I think what glitch art does is it reintroduces the human into computing yeah. because it's to do with finding error. I mean, all of these things that I'm using are errors that I've found in programs or I've found a way to force them to act in ways which they're not meant to. But then I think you create a kind of lyricism. Yeah, yeah, that's the thing, yeah. Amazing. Yeah. I'm in yeah. awe. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So I think I'll stop that at that point then because it's, yeah, if that's okay. I mean, I could go on for hours doing this, but it's very self-indulgent. <laughs> I think we could work for hours. Yeah. Well, the thing is, it, it the way of working like this, it turns a desktop from being something where you work or work on to being a focus and, I suppose, a point of investigation. It Again, it turns the, human, the computer into something more human and more mm -hmm. approachable. As I say, this environment is the process of about a year or so's, two years work really between me and the other people working in format C. You know, I designed the basic structure for this and a lot of the programs as well, well, the way they work. So 
So you can see now the background is like that. Mm. And if I'm just going to pull up that there just to stop that. Now, if I've actually done this correctly, which I might not have done, uh, let's go to files. There should be a folder. Yeah. So now from this session, I have a few images. Uh, let's see, not that one. So we've actually taken these images in real time. I just have to, yeah, there we go. So from there to there to there. So these are taken by the computer as we go along. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So again, I mean, from this session, I might post these images online on one of the groups I'm part of. So, yeah. Are those Facebook groups or Instagram? Um, I don't really, I don't use Facebook anymore. Um, no. I had a big falling out with a lot of people on there, um, as I was telling Alice earlier, because of something called NFTs. And it's oh, been a, yeah. a big schism within the kind of groups that I work with. People are very pro NFTs and people are very anti them. I'd be on the anti side. Yeah. And it's it's not a good thing at all. No, it's not. Uh, so I'll stop sharing the screen there. And right, okay. So anybody has any questions? So a lot of the codes, um, do you, do you have a kind of like um, how much control do you like to have over it, or is it the kind of like the serendipity of what might come up with that's quite exciting? It's the serendipity a lot of the time. I know what the the scripts that I'm using will do, but you can never predict mm. the interactions between the various windows. I'm very limited with what I'm showing you now because I'm not working from a uh, physical computer, it's actually a virtual computer that I set up specifically for this. It hasn't got enough power to run everything, but I can run multiple windows, multiple videos, and it, it's all about looking for that moment where things gel, where things are right visually. Something I'm used to, I suppose, that Jenny will probably attest to in painting, where there's a moment in a painting where everything comes together and you think, yeah, that's the composition that's where to leave it. And it's that point, I suppose I'm looking at what I'm doing with the painterly eye as well. I haven't completely thrown everything out of the window. Um, but yeah, it, it's, it's the codes I set running and they run and I'm waiting and then I find it and then it's there. And then you try and keep it on that precarious balance of it working and not working. And a lot of the time it will just collapse and you have to start again, that's fine. You know, it's all part of the process. As, as I say, I'll have, um, sometimes I'll have a record running in the background to record that. And yeah, so, but I mean, the most important thing to me is also sharing the codes that I use because other people have been good enough to write programs that I can freely use. So I see it as my obligation to share what I do with other people. So I've done tutorials on my blog and I, people have asked me questions constantly about how I've done something and it's important to share that information because to me as I said at the beginning to me it's a new form of artistic literacy mm -hmm. and it's the very very early days of that and, and to be on on that is great it's it's wonderful you know to share knowledge and what's the name of your blog uh it's crash dot that's it <laughs> crash dot yeah stop oh sorry stop yeah it's on Blogger, so just crash dot Blogger, that'll be it. Blogger. Yeah. Um, I post work to Tumblr, and also this is another thing I'm trying to move away from corporate spaces like Facebook and yeah. Google and things like that, just because of the influence that they have. And it's very very heartening to see um, the EU has started um, pushing things like PeerTube, which is uh, an open source and freely available version, well, not version, but kind of analog of YouTube, which anybody can run, basically. And uh, uh, an analog to Twitter called Mastodon, which again is open source and anybody can join that for free and use it for free, which is, and it's not full of advertising and corporate agendas. And the good thing about Mastodon as opposed to Twitter is that they don't use algorithms which 
push up certain posts or boost certain things which get loads of likes it's a constant flow and that's one of the disheartening things of working online in places like facebook where people can gain the system through gaming the algorithm so certain work will get seen more because they've got a pile on from their russian bot friends and it all gets very odd you know instagram is kind of like that Mm. Um, I've gone back to actually using Tumblr more than Instagram because just the framing of uh, work is better. And I think the community there is kinder than Instagram. It's less cold, even though I know a lot of the artists on Instagram through Facebook. So it's kind of this strange networking thing, I suppose. Yeah. Anyway, yes. <laughs> Any more questions? just to say that i found it absolutely fascinating and very entrancing but also mm. intellectually stimulating and very very nice to see didn't expect anything like this at all this evening <laughs> thank you <laughs> andrew's got his hand up He's... let's see Andrew? Can I hear your audio? Uh, mm, audio problems. Is there a chat thing? Yeah, you could put your question into the chat. I can see at the side there. Yeah, um, it's possible that I'll come back. Yeah. yeah. You're back. You're back. You're okay. Yeah. <laughs> the, the reason for that is that I was listening through some Bluetooth headphones rather yeah. than just through the speaker of my phone. Yeah. And I haven't quite worked out how to move from one to the other without just putting the Bluetooth headphones back in the box and apparently waiting and that disconnects them. Mm. And then I come back again. I can't work out how to speak uh, without taking them off. Uh, I, I was wondering if there's um, what relationship, if any, there is between this and live coding, if you've come across live coding? Yeah, I've, I've sure you heard have. of it, yeah. It's probably fairly similar aims, I'd say. I mean, a lot of the methodology that I use would be used by DJs and people like that as well in live situations. Yeah. But live coding is a bit more seat of the pants. Are you talking about things like, um, what's that program now? There is one program, yeah. I'm just trying to bring it to mind, which is a JavaScript program, which you can do some amazing visuals with live. So you're changing the code in real time, so it changes the shapes and the whole look of the thing. You can bring in other elements. So yeah, sort of, yeah. I'd say it has similarities, yeah. But I mean... <laughs> Because I've got a list of, I've got so many scripts that I can pull up in one of my own sessions that do different things. It's, it's kind of hard to say that it's live, I suppose, in that sense. The visuals are live, definitely. So, yeah, probably some similarity, yes. Yeah, I, I, I was wondering, and I, I couldn't decide whilst you were talking, mm. whether, it, whether it was live coding or was... I, I don't, yeah, that's so. I, I mean, I can change the scripts in real time if I wish to. Yeah. I mean, that's, okay, that's, so. yeah, that's easy enough. It just, just takes calling up the, the command line, the script's running from, Five. stopping it and restarting yeah. it. And yeah, it can be done that way. I mean, the first few times that I did this, I actually did it that way. So I'd have dozens and dozens of terminal windows all running different programs. I'd stop the program at a certain point if I wanted to change something so I can change um the hex editing which alters the appearance of the thing it's manip it's it's um what should i say it's, it's destroying the image in a very particular way using hex editing by adding in more or less values so i can do that live um the the window size i can change um the color space i can change live as well if i want to but it's all down to stopping and starting the scripts if i'm calling the scripts just from a menu then it's just calling that particular script, as I say. But yeah, it's, yeah, I could do that. Yeah, that's easy enough. Once you know where, if, as long as you remember where the terminals are, <laughs> it gets very complicated. <laughs> okay, to, based on my very sketchy knowledge of, of live, what live coding is, that that is it basically. Yeah. It's, it's changing the yeah. 
bits of the actual bits of the code in yeah. real time yeah to perform. so if you're doing that live then yeah. i think that is it yeah yeah, yeah. so and it's it's never going back to spontaneity it's never the same thing twice never the same thing twice i didn't expect the images to come out the way they did as they just did there's no kind of you know it's not repeatable in some ways i can repeat the same scripts a hundred times and they'll give me different results a hundred times just because of the way the nature of feedback works i suppose but it, it's kind of yeah yeah And you said something about you you find the errors in the codes or the way that you can yes. like yeah. I thought that was really fascinating because I've yeah. heard of um FFmpeg and yeah. I think Studio. I think um my brother helps me with the coding side of stuff and we've used those in different things. Yeah. But I was like, I've never seen them being used in this way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's it's um part of the the thing people there's again, there's another schism in the glitch art community community where people just use apps or something like Photoshop where, or After Effects, where you just buy an effect and put it on top. And that's glitch aesthetic. But a lot of us deep down into it are actually actively going through, I've got a lot of hardware, which I'm looking through constantly. And video cards in particular will give very, very specific errors under certain circumstances. But it's finding those circumstances. So I'm constantly trying to find the gap in things either physically through, I mean, I've gone as crude as taking a screwdriver to a graphics card and shorting parts on the chip just to get different effects. That works quite well. But again, you have to weigh that up against, you might banjax the computer at the same time. But, you know, as you can see from my camera, I've got dozens of these cameras which all do slightly different effects. So it's, it's the willingness to get down and dirty and not accepting the defaults of software or hardware because they're, they're human made and we should be able to do with them as we wish, which is why I keep emphasizing the open source and creative commons aspect of what I do. You should have the freedom to run whatever software you want to on whatever hardware you want to as a right because you bought it, it's yours. So it, it's kind of the whole politics behind that is interesting as well. Um, FMPEG itself, you can actually recompile it, which means you, but you get it as source code and you can actually change some of the settings within the video codex. The video codex themselves aren't standard. And there's a guy called Nick Briz, um, who's a guy who was part of the Chicago School of the Arts in Chicago, which is where a lot of glitch art comes from. He brought out a whole distribution of Linux, which has this way of remixing all the codecs. So all your codecs are unique to you. So you can make your own unique kind of looking things. I mean, the more people use presets and apps, the more samey it gets. And that's a real problem for um, glitch art and digital art in, in general, that people use the same presets or they use the same operating system. So you get the same look, the same feel. And... A lot of the hardcore people are basically using Linux and the stuff that I'd use as well. So, and often on very, very broken, I mean, the monitor that I'm talking to you, looking at you now is actually trash picked. I picked it up from a dump. <laughs> a lot of my computers are just pulled out of skips and, you know, rebuilt. So it's the kind of the other form of artistic literacy where you're taking command and control of the devices that you use and making them your own in the same way that you'd prepare a canvas or mix your own paints. It's, it's all of a, a similar thing to me. It's just a different kind of literacy, that's all, I suppose. I'm rambling on there. <laughs> I really like the parallels you're making with other um, things as well, like that, you know, making parallels with painting and stuff. Mm. I think that adds another layer and another dimension to it as well. Mm. well so, as I said, I, I'm, I'm a, a painter at heart. And up until 10 years ago, where when I discovered an error on a camera, I was a painter. I mean, I, I've been exhibited. I've painted hundreds of paintings. Uh, it's really interesting. Jenny was talking about surrealism because my work is basically surrealist still life when I paint it. Very finely observed, very finely detailed um, paintings. So, yeah, it, it's a lot of painting, I suppose, painterliness in what I do. Yeah, definitely the way that I look at things, yeah. 
I see constantly parallels, but it's it's trying to bridge the the understanding gap between different branches. I mean, sometimes I'm not even sure that I'm making art. <laughs> it's just that I'm not, I don't know anymore. <laughs> Probably where it's most interesting. If you, yeah, <laughs> you yeah. don't know what you're doing, you don't know whether it's art or not. That's exciting. <laughs> but as the glitch artists say, if it's wrong, it's right. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, again, it's interesting what Jenny was saying about surrealism because surrealism is one of my biggest influences, and especially Giorgio de Chirico. And I went so far as to build tiny little townscapes to paint from as still lives. I had them on my desktop and I, I kind of painted from them and put in little figures and collected items. I love the fact that you're collecting items like the, the sponge and things like that and the brush because they are domestic, but to take them out of their domestic context illustrates their hidden life. And all these objects have hidden lives and that fascinates me as well. So yeah, it's, I like seeing people working with surrealism. It's good, it's very good. I think there's a really interesting um, crossover between your practices. This is what I really enjoy about the Art Lab um, program is that um, I don't curate it, so it is mm. just artists booking a slot whenever they can, whenever it suits. But then the commonalities that come out of the presentations and people's practices, which isn't a kind of premeditated thing mm. at all, um, yeah, it kind of brings out those kind of things. I think because I think. If there was one presentation per event, then we wouldn't have those mm. references and crossovers, I think. Yeah. So, yeah, it's been been great tonight. Thank you both. Has anyone got any other comments or questions before we wrap up? Oh, just a huge thanks. Thank you very much. Crash Stop, that was absolutely amazing. Thank you. And thanks for the opportunity, Alice. Yes, definitely. Thanks. It's, it's been fun. Nights, actually, so thanks to everybody. Yeah. yeah, really great evening. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Great. Thanks all. Hope to Thanks. see you again soon. Yes. Bye. 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 Enjoy the rest of your evening. Bye. Yes. Bye. Bye. <laughs>